Good morning. Please bear with me as this is my first <laughs> like sermon, big talk besides just casual talk. <laughs> um, and if you have questions, please just remember them uh, because afterwards, uh, as they had mentioned, we're going to have a continued slideshow as there is hundreds of photos and um, this is the time for me to share with you about my journey to the promised, well, the promised land to the exodus to the Bible lands. Okay, well, here, here I am in this photo. Um, as behind me is the Pyramid of Giza. So what better place to start the story of exodus but in Cairo, in Egypt, in the very land that the Egyptians were, you know, the great laborers of Egypt, the builders. They were blessed with wisdom by God, and Pharaoh, he's like, well, that's, that's the right employees to hire. <laughs> so, well, as we, here we have a very large hole. They discovered grain in the bottom of this hole. It is, as you can see in the photo, you can't see the bottom. I wasn't able to see the bottom. Um, but the Bible verse, Genesis 41, verses 35 and 36 says, and let them gather all the food of those good years that are coming and store up grain under the authority of Pharaoh and let them keep food in the cities. Well, this is, refers to when Joseph had had the, um, interpreted the dream of Pharaoh of the years of famine. And so when Joseph was put over the uh, responsibilities of Egypt, he prepared by storing up grain. Well, the likelihood is these were the grain holders because there hasn't been any other site that showed such a situation. And as well as this is uh, the tomb of the Pharaoh, um, de jour, I'm not exactly. Let's go to the next slide. This is a step pyramid. It is one of the oldest pyramids and burial mounds in Egypt. Go to the next slide. Here is the step pyramid in the courtyard. Um, at the base and center um, in this photo is a hole that was dug a thousand years after the pyramid was built. Um, another pharaoh uh, wanted to, I guess, get inside. Um, but what's unique about it is the petroglyphs, um, Egyptian writing, expresses that this tomb was built by um, Imhotep. And the stories of who Imhotep is all depicts as Joseph, because it says that uh, Imhotep had saved Egypt from a time of famine of seven years, and there is a lot of correlation um, that matched. And so I'll tell you a little bit about that pharaoh. It says that he employed an advisor um, who had designed that pyramid, which at the time, until that, before that pyramid was built, everything was just burial mounds. And so, actually inside this uh, pyramid, I was able to go inside, and when you look up, you see big pieces of wood that have been intertwined to create like a rebar to hold the load, and to, believe, to realize how old the structure is is quite amazing. Uh, next slide. And this is Imhotep's coffin. Um, Joseph died in 1635 BC and Genesis, Genesis 50 verse 26 says Joseph died being 110 years old and they embalmed him and he was put in a coffin in Egypt and so with the inscriptions of Imhotep the storyline the fact that um, Joseph also was buried in Egypt according to the customs um, tells us that we can speculate that the likelihood is Imhotep was Joseph. Next slide. Well, from the time of Joseph, then we have Moses. Well, Moses, you know, many of us know the story. Moses um, was, survived a time when 
they were trying to kill, and they were killing all the young children. And Moses fled at Pharaoh after he had killed a Jew. Um, and he went to the land of Midian. In Exodus 2, verses 16 17 says, Now the priest of Midian had seven daughters, and they came and drew water, and they filled the troughs to water their father's flocks. Then the shepherds came and drove them away, but Moses stood up and helped them and watered their flock. Well, this well right here is in the land of Midian at Albada, um, which is just across from Egypt, um, across from the Gulf, across the Red Sea. Um, and it is a very, very old well, and it is known as the land of Midian. Here's the well in Albada. It is very deep, it is very unique because the, um, the rock structure shows that water must have come up. Um, and according to the locals, the whole area, you just dig 20 feet down and you'll have water. So this well is no longer used uh, because the water table has shifted. Uh, next slide. This is overlooking Albada to the right of the photo. Um, and the land of Midian. In the far right of the photo, farthest right in the distance, is an area of tombs. Um, and, uh, yeah. Next slide. These are the Nabataean tombs, which are referred to in culture and in scripture as Jethro's tombs. Um, these ones are dated in the first century. Uh, many of them have been um, used by different people over time. And there is a lot of them. Uh, I believe there was at least 20 structural tombs like this, as well as simple ones as the one on the far right, which is just a hole in the wall. But these tombs would hold dozens of people. Uh, they, would, they have these little square, you know, like coffin areas that they would place them. So now we are going to the time of the Exodus. So this photo is a Google Earth photo overlooking uh, the Gulf of Aqaba um, with Saudi Arabia on one side and Egypt on the other. Uh, the reason this is unique is at the town of Nueva, it says in Exodus 13, Verses 18, so God led the people around by way of the wilderness of the Red Sea, and the children of Israel went up in orderly ranks out of the land of Egypt. Well, at this location there is uh, old Egyptian fortresses, um, as well as when you come down to the shoreline there, you, are, you have wilderness behind you. As you can see, there's like a little snake. That's the, uh, the valley Watar. Um, which you can travel through fairly easy because it's not uh, mountainous. But if you get to that location, you would definitely be walled in, as it says in scripture. Um, this is a pillar that is believed to have been built during the time of King of Solomon as a memorial of the Exodus crossing. Um, it had originally been found down in the ocean and had been later brought up to the little current location, which overlooks the town of Nueva. And Exodus 14, verses 1 through 3. Now the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, that they turn and camp before um, Pi Haroth, <laughs> between Migdal and the sea, opposite Baal Zephon. You shall camp before it by the sea. For Pharaoh will say of the children of Israel, they are bewildered by the land. The worldness has closed them in. Thus expresses that they were very trapped. This is looking from uh, Nueva to Saudi Arabia. So that's just Saudi Arabia right over there. Not very far. Exodus 14 verses 21 and 22 says, Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind all that night and made the sea into dry land and the waters were divided. What a magnificent sight that would have been 
to see the waters receding and being able to escape the Egyptians as, you know, just, we know that the Israelites were known for complaining, so they get to a, a beach and they're trapped and they're, Moses, what, what is this? And God opens a way for them to escape. So this is one of the sites. This is, this, in this photo, the line is going from Nueva across to Saudi Arabia. Um, and it is one of the two, primarily in one group, that we believe as the primary Red Sea crossings, mainly due to the historical and geological um, ability from the references that we do know. And then uh, many people say, well, it's, the water's deep there. Well, we're talking about a long time ago and, you know, an act of God. So we have to have some faith in understanding the things that we don't know. Um, some facts about Moses. Moses left Egypt in 1486 BC and the Exodus crossing was about 40 years later in 1446. Uh, Mo Moses was also known as Tut Moses II and Tutankhamun Commons was the firstborn of Tut Moses IV would have been a descendant within the uh, Pharaoh line that Moses had been attached to. So this is in the town of uh, Hackle. Um, it is a town at the top of Saudi Arabia corner next to the town of, uh, next to the country of Jordan. Um, and that photo is looking over at Egypt uh, across the Gulf of Aqaba uh, towards Nueva. And Uniquely, Nueva means waters of Moses. So this, in this next slide, we have uh, one of the valleys looking down at the Gulf of Aqaba uh, over at Nueva. Uh, this valley is one of the areas that we believe the Israelites would have come into, uh, mainly because it is that's the only way you can travel is through valleys. That's how the locals travel. They follow the riverbeds, uh, which they call wadis. Um, and as we traverse, uh, Exodus 15, 22 says, So Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea, and they went out into the wilderness of Shur, and they went three days in the wilderness and found no water. Um, from the Red Sea crossing to the next location, as the crow flies, is about 62 miles. And if we consider at how fast an average person walks and if how long the days are there, um, they could have easily met that criteria as well as when you consider that the primary method of travel is walking. So they were good at walking. <laughs> we, we forget in the modern times walking's hard when it's, it's not. You can if you practice. This is magna which is uh, known as the Springs of Moses. What's unique about the spot is there is lots of water. Even to this day, there are sp uh, areas where you just can go up and there's water coming out of the ground. Uh, they use it a lot for irrigating for date palms, which are what majority of those trees are there. Um, I am standing on a fortress in this photo. Uh, it is considered one of the oldest, I believe, uh, Nabataean uh, fortresses um, in the Saudi Arabian area um, for the things that are preserved in the site. Um, as I went up there, I discovered things that I was surprised about. Uh, the locals are always looking for gold, so they were digging uh, up areas there. Um, but the fortress was there to protect the water source as everyone, when you need water to survive, everyone wants it. This is another site nearby of water and wells. Um, it is called Taib al-Ism. Um, and it is believed that it could possibly be one of the sites the Israelites visited, um, known as Elam, um, as the valleys wander about um, in the region. So it's not really a straight path they would have traveled. Now we are in Horeb. This is overlooking the plains in that area. Um, so
so as in the story of Exodus, they traveled uh, to the springs, and then they traveled next to, into the wilderness, and they ended up running into the Malachites, or not the Malachites, yeah, the Malachites, and Exodus 17, verse 8, now Amalek came and fought with Israel in Rephidim, and so it is believed that in these plains, in this photo, is where the Israelites fought. So in the top, slightly to the left of the photo, is what is believed to be the split rock. Exodus 17 verses 1 through 2 says, Then all the congregation of the children of Israel set out on their journey from the wilderness of sin, according to their commandment of the Lord, and camped in Rephidim, but there was no water to the people to drink. Therefore the people contended with Moses and said, Give us water that we may drink. Here is what is known as the split rock. Exodus 17, verses 6 through 7. Behold, I stand before you there on the rock in Horeb, and you shall strike the rock, and water will come out of it, and the people may drink. What's unique about this rock to this day is the locals in the area, even though the only people who live in this area are the um, Bedouins, the, the natives, the tribesmen who travel with their camels. And we actually met people out there who were named after this rock. So it is unique. There is also petroglyphs in the region and other historical things signifying that this is a unique location. It is also on the other side of the mountain of Sinai, uh, thus giving it in the right region, saying that they had camped uh, beside Sinai uh, before actually getting there because there's a mountain in the way. Here we are at the mountain of Sinai. Exodus 19, one through two says, in the third month after the children of Israel had gone out of the land of Egypt on the same day, they came to the wilderness of Sinai for they had departed from Rehadim and had come to the wilderness of Sinai and camped in the wilderness. So Israel camped there before the mountain. So, mm -hmm. you see in the laser, so where the laser's at is a cave, and it is believed to be the cave of Elijah, and then this is what is believed to be Mount Sinai. Uh, it is all blackened. Some speculate that it is blackened due to the presence of God, uh, but we're not quite sure about that, as uh, in the region there's a lot of basalt, and the black rock is actually found in other areas. Um, but the, what makes this area unique, even though Traditionally, uh, it is said that Sinai is in Egypt, and there's a whole story on that, which is very unique. Uh, another unique thing is that the word Sinai uh, is just, by strong definition, is a mountain of Arabia. So that tells us that Sinai won't be in Egypt just by its Arabic name. So in this photo, we have what is believed to be the gold calf altar site. Exodus 32 verse four says, and he received the gold from their hand and he fashioned it with an engraving tool and made a molded calf. Then they said, this is your God, O Israel, that brought you out of the land of Egypt. The reason we believe it is the golden calf site is not just because it's a mound that would allow you to put a golden calf on top of and allow people to see, but it is also in the viewing distance of Mount Sinai, as well as at least, how oh, I didn't count them all, a hundred calf petroglyphs on it of not just cows, but of other animals. Um, that are quite old, thus signifying it having a historical influence in the area. Yeah, here's another closer photo. And there is one photo of just some of those petroglyphs um, showing camels and cows. And the reason they date this, or that it's appropriate, is because they're able to tell what type of cows they are by according to their 
uh, coloring and horn shapes on whether or not they are Egyptian cows or Saudi Arabian cows. And as we know in scripture that the Israelites traveled with livestock. As the story of Exodus goes, after they built the golden calf and Moses finds out there was a consequence. Exodus 32, verses 27 and 28. And he said to them, thus says the Lord God of Israel, let every man put his sword on his side and go in and out from entrance to entrance throughout the camp and let every man kill his brother and every man his companion, every man his neighbor. So the sons of Levi did according to the word of Moses and about 3,000 men of the people fell that day. So uh, the best way to describe it is just on the other side of the mountain on your right is the golden calf site, which would be outside the camp of Moses. And there is a large formation of rocks with grinding stones and burial mounds. And even on the hill in this photo where I'm standing, there are um, burial mounds from the past century, um, thus making it a unique site that we believe to be the site of the 3000 because the rocks are all stacked in squares and circles, thus um, a common tradition that is still used today to bury people. In this photo, I'm Mount Sinai is behind me, and you see the rock formation. Well, that rock formation there depicts um, the altar of Moses, where they would have brought uh, animals in for slaughter. Well, the reason the structure is on an angle is according to uh, people who study livestock is that if you have a pen that's where they can see the whole pen but there's no exit they won't leave but if you have an angle they'll go in and not realize they're trapped um, as well as around this site is a lot of quarried marble um, which was we believe was uh, placed during the time of Solomon uh, as a memorial of Mount Sinai and we actually found the quarry site it is four hour hike up river at a marble location, which is immense to comprehend. Uh, some people have asked, oh, the Israelites must have built it. Well, the Israelites weren't there long enough to necessarily build a road and haul large pieces of marble back. Um, we did find signs of the road uniquely, um, as it's hard to really find anything there because it's so old, but we found areas of rock that were stacked up against the mountain um, as a support for a road. Here, here. And here are some of those marble pillars, square blocks. Um, there's at least a couple dozen of them. Um, and that is looking up into that valley. So to, I hiked to the mountain of uh, Mount Sinai, to the summit, and it took about four hours one way, eight hours round trip. Um, and in that valley, there is water. So at this site right here, um, at the altar site, you're above the flood area. Uh, one of the reasons we believe it's altar site is when the Saudi government had first discovered the site, it was pretty much buried and they dug it up and discovered all these rocks and stacked it according to they, the way they found it. But they also found a massive deposit of charcoal and ash, uh, thus giving evidence for it to be the altar site. This is looking down from the summit. So the golden calf site is there. And the altar site is here. And then the barrel of 3,000 is over to the left. So it is believed that the Israelites probably camped out here because it's very smooth, easy place to camp, but it's only a few minute walk from the rest. What is really unique about the area is the, your voice echoes. So when you're at the altar site, we had someone hike all the way up to um, the cave and holler down at us and we could hear him just fine. And we were, that was pretty impressive. And then we, we hollered back and he's like, no, I, I hear you, you know? And if you have a voice that carries your ability to express things would be possible. Um, 
and as we hiked all the way up to the mountain until you, as long as you're in that valley, it's just, it's an echo chamber, which was pretty convincing <laughs> for, for myself. I was like, if you got to talk to a lot of people, how do you do it? Well, if you have a natural echo chamber, that's going to help. So this is uh, just below in the other photo, there's a plateau. So when you hike up, you come to, a, you hike for about two hours and you come to a plateau and then you got maybe an hour and a half till you get to the summit. At this plateau, uh, even to this day, the Bedouins bring their donkeys and can't other uh, livestock like uh, goats up through these mountains to feed on the grasses that grow up there. Um, and it would make sense that again, that this is Mount Sinai, because at this plateau would be appropriate for where the uh, elders of the Israelites waited while Moses was up on Mount Sinai talking to God, uh, as it is uh, not very far, but you're already on the mountain. So this is looking at Egypt. So that mountain just right there, that's Egypt from Mount Sinai. And so you know, with America being so big, it's, it's when you realize, well, no, this, there's mountains there, but it's all very condensed. And so that's actually looking at Egypt. And here we are at the summit. So my fellow companions, um, the individual on the left, that was his first trip out of the U.S. And he went to Saudi Arabia as his first trip out of the U.S. And he said it was the most exceptional, it was amazing for him. Um, another individual is a retired Air Force man who really helped keep our team together and he has now continued to help um, our explorations out there. I just want to say thank you for, um, for this time and, and reflect on how this is, you know, evidence and signs of the reality. We hear these stories growing up, we hear about the Exodus, we hear about these things, but to actually see them in person, I mean, I'm showing you just photos, but I have to say it was, I mean, it's archaeology. Anytime you're doing archaeology, we have to investigate, we have to find evidence, and so if you go on the internet, you'll find many versions, and um, interpretations, um, but I'd have to say this, for me, it was very strong evidence and it makes very strong sense. So, And if you want to find out more, you can just visit us on YouTube at Discovered Media or on the web at discoveredsinai.com and we have my friend who's over there. He is continually doing research and exploring the area. And you can check him out online. You can visit yourself or you can get involved. He has lots of uh, new information um, constantly ongoing as he continues to research the biblical area. Gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for this time that we've all got together and that you been able to allow me to share my journey. May you be with everyone and protect them and bless them as they go about their day. In your holy, precious name, amen. 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 To reach a friend with a Christ-centered message of hope and wholeness. This has been Anderson SDA Church in Northern California. Thank you for joining us. For more information, visit our website at andersonadventist.org. We look forward to seeing you next time.